pleasure for me to be here and as John said I'm going to talk about the spectral decomposition and an extension of a theorem of Atmon, a couple leading to a spectral subspaces for research preparators and let me start with an introduction and these are going to be our main characters today and those are bishop operators. Bishop operators are, de are defined as follow. If, oops, if alpha is an irrational number between zero and one, the bishop operator G alpha acts on LP of zero one like the operator that takes any function U to the function U composed with the fractional part of T plus alpha, and then we multiply by T. So, this is the weighted composition operator or also called weighted translation operator. And it's the composition of two simple operators. One is just the multiplication by empty, the multiplication by independent variable. And this is a well-known operator we do understand very well. And the other one is a composition operator induced by the symbol phi alpha just phi alpha of t equal to fractional part of t plus alpha. And the situation is that we also understand very well this composition operator, indeed in L2 is unitary, and in LP has a complete set of eigenvectors, the, the Fourier basis, and each of them is, uh, is associated to an eigenvalue of multiplicity one. So both operators that play a role in the definition of a bishop operator are very, very well understood. We even can complicate the definition, but we will see in a moment that these operators are complicated enough in order to make it this definition as simple, but we can complicate the weight or the composition map. All right, the question is why studying bishop operators, I mean, why is focus on that concrete examples of operators? And I think they're interested in their service because uh, there are many open questions regarding them, but probably one that makes more sense nowadays, at least from my perspective, is that they were proposed by a red bishop in the 50 as uh, operator without no non-trivial closed invariant subspace in LP. In other words, as a possible counterexamples to the invariant subspace problem in LP. We know that the invariant subspace problem asks if every linear bounded operator has a non-trivial closed invariant subspace, it's open in reflexive Banach spaces. So this operator were proposed as a possible counterexamples, and it is still an open problem to determine if every bishop operator has non-trivial closed invariant subspace in LP, independently of the rational alpha. Okay, so I'm going to try to address this question, and I will tell you what is known and what we have proved, and which rationals are left. But if you want to understand the invariant subspaces of the bishop operator, the first thing you have to understand is how it acts on a function. I mean, the span of the uh, orbit of any function in LP. And if you consider just a function u in LP, continuous if you wish, then the first iterates produce a discontinuity at one minus alpha. The second iterate produce another discontinuity at one minus two alpha. And so, so forth, and indeed, the iterates are going to zero in none, and they are producing discontinuity at one minus n alpha for any n. So that's the behavior. And in 1974, Debbie proved that if alpha is a non-Liouville irrational number, 
then the Bishop operator induced by alpha has non-trivial closed invariant subspaces in LP. Indeed, he proved that it has non-trivial closed hyper-invariant subspaces in LP. That means that they are invariant and the every operator that commutes with the alpha. And what is a Liouville number? A Liouville number is an irrational such that for every n, there exists an irreducible rational number, Pn over Qn, such that, uh, let's see if I can, oops, I don't know, is it here? Oh yeah, such that we can approximate alpha with this order. I mean, in some sense, Liouville number are those irrational that we can, uh, I mean, they are very similar to rational because we can approximate up to any order, okay? So if alpha is any, a non-Liouville irrational, then Debye's theorem tells you that this operator has non-trivial closed invariant subspaces. Actually, if uh, you know a little bit about mm, analytic number theory, jarni vesikovic theorem tells you that Liouville irrationals form a set not only of Lebesgue measure zero, but also of vanishing household dimension. And in particular, that tells you that for almost every alpha in zero one, the Bishop operator has non-trivial closed invariant subspace. But there is a still the Liouville numbers that are left there. And let's see what we can say about them. In order to understand those, I mean, those operators, let us just focus a little bit about Davis inside in order to prove his theorem. And what he did, and I will come back later on this, was trying to use a result, a theorem by Bermer for invertible operators. Liouville operate, Liouville, uh, sorry, Bishop operators are not invertible. And we will see that the spectrum independently of alpha consists of a disk of center zero and reduce e to minus one. But what, they, what David did was considering Bermer's theorem that says that if you have a linear bounded operator and an invertible operator G that satisfy this condition, this series is convergent, then if the spectrum is not singleton, the operator has non-trivial closed hyperinvariant subspace. And what he tried was trying to uh, approach a bishop operator by means of certain approximation, and as we know for the invariant subspaces or to study invariant subspaces approximations that not work pretty nicely, but here it worked using Bernstein's theorem. Actually, uh, McDonald extended uh, much more recently the results by Debbie to bishop type operator, but he didn't pass uh, the wall of Liouville number. He, he was considering different kind of weights, phi of t, and the same composition operator, but he didn't pass the Liouville wall, let's say. And more recently, Flateau, uh, in his PhD thesis, he extended Debye's theorem and proved that Bishop operator has non-trivial closed invariant subspaces, including some Liouville numbers. Among them, for instance, the classical Liouville number, the sum one over ten to j factorial. Okay. All right. And the ideas in both uh, results, we're trying to use also something that was generalizing Bermer's theorem, and that was Atmon theorem. And the question that is, given any irrational alpha, does the alpha have a non-trivial closed invariant subspace? And uh, what I'm going to say is that for more Liouville's, it does have. And we're going to show that we may enlarge the class of irrationals. And how are we going to do that? It's trying to understand what is boiling down, and this is by means of Atmon theorem. 
And what is boiling down is related to how we use a functional calculus model in this context. So let me recall, I know there are some experts in the audience about Banach algebras and Berling algebras. Just let me recall briefly what it does consist. So if we have a sequence, rho m, <coughs> positive real numbers, right, in one infinity, and we consider a rho the Banach space of functions on the continuous function and the torus such that the known can, is given by this series, this is the Fourier coefficients. If the sequence log of rho m is subadditive, that means that this condition holds, then the, this is a rho is a unital Banach algebra under the pointwise multiplication. Indeed, a sequence of real numbers just the first one normalized is equal to one, all of them bigger or equal than one. It's called a Berlin sequence whenever it's subadditive, the log of wrong name is subadditive, and it satisfies this condition. If you look at this, this is the condition that appeared in Bermer's theorem. It was log of the norm of Tn for T, an invertible operator. So the norm of Tn is what explains the role here, and it's also satisfying that the this condition, right, clearly. All right, this is the Berlin sequence for us, and we can give examples of Berlin sequences. The first one, the easiest one, is this sequence, for s bigger or equal than zero, or the exponential, this is a constant c positive, and sigma is any constant, bigger, strictly bigger than one. The exponential of m beta, it's important that beta cannot be one, and many others. Why are they important in this context? They are important because they come into play in this theorem of Atmo, which is our second character in the story today. And it tells you the following. Assume you have a Banach space X and a linear bounded operator, and assume you can, you can consider two vectors in X naught in X and Y naught in X uh, in the dual, and those are the bilateral orbits of those vectors. Right? Those vectors are different from zero. And assume that the sequence of the non of the bilateral orbit are dominated by the Berlin sequence. That means that there exists a constant C such that this non is less than C times rho M for the Berlin sequence rho M. Okay? That's domination. All right. Assume, in addition, that you are able to find a point in the a torus in the unit circle such that these two vector evaluate uh, analytic functions which are well defined in the complements of the torus of the unit circle uh, do not have analytic continuation through the neighborhood of that point. Then if T is not a multiple of the identity it has a hyper invariant subspace. All right, well, first time you see this it's like a crazy theorem in some sense because those two analytic functions seems to be weird appearing there and they are constructed through the bilateral orbits of the, of the vector, right? But first thing that you can say is that because of the definition of those two functions, the fact that these norms are dominated by the Berlin sequence implies in particular that they are analytic, they converge absolutely in the complements of the unit circle, and they are analytic inside the unit circle and outside the unit circle and at infinity, and by Liouville's theorem, it tells you that it has to have a singularity on the boundary of the unit disk. So at least the singularity exists. So what we're asking is that there exists a common singularity in some sense that we cannot extend analytically through that point. All right. Why is the, those uh, Banach algebras important? Okay, if you have a Berlin sequence, then what happens is that the function in that Banach algebra is invertible if and only if it's different from zero for every theta in the torus. And in particular, the Banach algebra is called, is what it is called regular, a regular Banach algebra. A regular Banach algebra is nothing on a 
compact metric space, nothing more than a, an algebra that can separate points and a compact subset. I mean, given any point in X and a compact subset K, we are all, West, uh, which is, not, sorry, yeah, which such that P does not belong to K, we are able to find a function F in the algebra such that at P is equal to one and the function is zero in K. So in some sense, we can separate the point and the compact subset. Okay, so the, the scheme usually in this context is if you have a regular Banach algebra, then it allows you to produce two functions such that the product is zero, but no one of them is zero, and that combined with a functional calculus argument provides invariant subspaces for, uh, for the operator you can apply that uh, functional calculus, of course. Okay, and this is what it is boiling down, and that was what Debbie and later McDonough and Flator did using Atmon theory. And this is the scheme behind the theorem, the first theorem I'm going to tell you about how large we know nowadays, uh, how large is the, the class of Liouville numbers that we know that T alpha has non-trivial closed invariant subspaces. In order to state the theorem, just recall that if you have an irrational number, this is the development of the irrational as a continuous function, and you can chop at any step n, and then what you get is just the convergence, right? And the theorem, which, which was a joint work with Fernando Chamizo and Adrián Ubis from Autónoma de Madrid, and my PhD student, Mosalve Lopez, tells you the following. If you have an irrational number alpha, and this is the sequence of convergence of the irrational, if the denominator of the convergence satisfies this growth condition, then the Bishop operators T alpha has a non-trivial closed invariant subspace. Okay, in LP. If you see this, the first thing that you may ask is, okay, how this came into play with the previous results? With the previous results, Debye's theorem follows as a consequence of that theorem and also flat out theorem and we can prove it and find out explicitly by applying Atzmann theorem, who is the uh, Berlin sequence that you need to plug in in the proof. Actually, by jarnik besikovic theorem that I told you, Liouville irrational form a, a set of vanishing house door dimension, but we can still measure the exception in the theorem that I just showed you and the exception in the previous theorem using the logarithmic Hausdorff dimension. Those are, by, uh, by means, I mean, using this uh, family of functions instead of the usual one. And the dimension, sorry, the exemption, the dimension of the extension in Debye's theorem is infinity because we are skipping all the living numbers. In Flatter's theorem, the dimension is four, the log Hausdorff dimension is four, and in our theorem, is two. So we really enlarge the set of irrationals, but still there are some Liouville numbers that we don't know what's happening. And this is the theorem once again. Let me tell you a little bit about the proof. This is the, the only ideas I'm going to give because I want to focus on the spectral decomposition. We can normalize the operator just multiplying by E, and this is what I told you at the beginning, and this is because the spectrum of any Bishop operator is just the disk of center zero, zero and radius E to minus one, so that tells you that the spectrum of T tilde alpha is just the closed unit disk. And then the game is trying to apply Atzmon theorem in this context, so the hard part that it's in Atzmon theorem, it's related to the singularity of those analytic functions, but here that's not difficult because whenever you have a point x0 in LP and you consider the two analytic functions that I was showing you before, one at x0 and the other one at x2 pi alpha t x0, those 
have a singularity and you can apply a Atmon theorem as far, I just restate it here, as far as you get that the two vectors in the space such that the sequence of the norms are dominated by a Berlin sequence because the second part you have as a consequence of that proposition. So this is all we have to do. We have to find out two vectors in the space, non-zero of course, non-zero vectors such that, oops, uh, I lost, yeah, for some reason, sorry. Such that these two sequences are bounded or are dominated by a Berlin sequence. Okay, so let's find the vector. And here, the construction is a dog, in the sense that we need, okay, we say who is going to be the vector, those are going to be the characteristic functions of B alpha, and this B alpha is constructed depending on the alpha we're considering, right? Here, x between brackets denotes the distance to the closest integer, and it has positive Lebesgue measure, and in step two, what we need to understand is how the iterates of T tilde alpha are acting on those vectors, which are the same. And this is not hard. Those are weighted composition operators. You can compute the weight. And those are the, the weights are given here. And this is how it acts. This is not hard. The hard part, or the more technical part, is a step three. And in step three, under some technical, after some technical lemmas, what we need to estimate is how big is uh, the weight of those uh, iterates. And this is the proposition that tells you that whenever you're living in B alpha, the weight that appears is controlled by this quantity. That depends on a deeper analysis of how these alphas are considering. And there is where the play of the hypothesis, this growth condition, is coming. Okay, once you have that, the last step is finding the appropriate Berlin sequence that dominates those two sequences of norm. And this is the Berlin sequence that come up here. And amazingly, we are adding several log that makes this in order to convert the series that we have in the definition of Berlin sequence. So once you're here, you can ask me, okay, you were constructed this special B alpha in order to prove your theorem. Uh, maybe someone else is a little bit more skillful, can give another B alpha, and then construct another Berlin sequence and go through and see if you can go further with the condition that you provided in the theorem. But maybe you can do that. But what we were able to prove is that you, you will not cover all the Liouville numbers, unfortunately, with this approach. Actually, if you consider M, the set of the rationals, such that the convergence satisfies this condition, look. Uh, look at here, there is this three in the previous theorem, there was a three here, a cube, right? Now it's missed. That's, okay, if you have an irrational such that it's not in M, that's, that's for fun, I mean, this log is infinity. So this tells you that we really found the threshold in Atzmon theorem in this context. I mean, we cannot apply Atzmon theorem in order to provide new, uh, hyper invariant subspaces for those Liouville numbers that are left by our theorem. So maybe you can improve that theorem, but you're not going to go too far. And the question is, okay, maybe we are not really dealing with the right approach. Okay, we know now more Liouville numbers, but we don't know all of them, and that was our goal. So maybe what we need to understand is the nature of the invariant subspaces that were appearing in this context. And this is what we tried. And in order to understand the nature, we come back to the beginning. 
When I was explaining to you about Debbie's theorem, I was telling you that he was using Bertmer's theorem that was used for, or that it's a, a theorem for invertible operators. In particular, what is here is that the condition, this series, implies that the spectrum of the operator is contained in the unit circle. But this implies much more, and that was observed by Kolohara and Foyas by the end of the 60s. Actually, it implies that the operator is decomposable. Recall, this was introduced by Foyas in 1963, that an operator, linear bounded operator, is decomposable. If for a very finite open cover, U1, U2, Ua of the spectrum, you can always find closed invariant subspaces such that the restriction of the operator to any of them is contained in the, to xj is contained in uj. Okay, and x, this is important, can be expressed as the sum of those closed immense subspaces. So in particular, I think I have the picture. Those are the cover, and those are the part of the spectrum that contains in any of the uh, elements of the cover. What Kolohara and Foyas proved is that if you have an operator that satisfies Vermeer's condition, then it's decomposable. It has a lot of invariant subspaces, actually, infinitely many, and all of them, com I mean, regarding to those open covers in some sense. Okay, but what I told you is that we were using Atzmon theorem. And Atzmon theorem can be seen, this is uh, not a way to state the, the large theorem I, I stated at the beginning, it's a sort of vector-wise version of Vermeer's theorem. It tells you that uh, if you have uh, the Berlin sequences that dominates these two, then I'm going to tell you about this in a second, but these are the resolvent, the local resolvent at the point. If this is not single at all, the operator has non-trivia hyperinvariant subspace. So if this is a vector-wise theorem, maybe there is a sort of weaker decomposition in this context, because we are using this, and maybe that could lead us to understand the invariant subspaces. And that was, that was the goal, indeed. And in order to show you the results regarding that goal, I need to recall a few things about local spectral theory. And if you have a linear bounded operator, T, on a Banach space, and a vector x, the local spectrum sigma t of x is just the complement of the points in the, the complex numbers such that there exists an open neighborhood, u lambda, and a, an, an analytic function such that you can invert, I mean, this is the inverse, t minus set i inverse x is f of z for every set in the open, uh, set U lambda. You can invert locally. Indeed, if, if this inverse is unique, for those that know about local spectral theory, the operator is said to have the single value extension property. Actually, for every operator T, linear bounded, and every vector, the local spectrum of T at X is a compact subset of sigma of T. But it, could, it can be empty. Right? If, if, for instance, if it, if it has the, the single value extension property, the local spectra at zero is just the empty set. And in this context, sorry. In this context, uh, one important uh, issue is about local spectral manifolds. And they are defined as follows, if you consider a subset in the complex plane, the local spectral manifold is just those vectors in the space such that their local spectra is contained in that subset omega. Why are they important? Amazingly, they are hyper-invariant linear manifold. The problem is that they're not closed, okay? 
they can be dense indeed. Actually, if a linear bounded operator satisfies that all of these uh, local spectral manifolds are closed for closed subset of uh, C, then the, the operator is said to have the doom for property of the C property. Unfortunately, our bishop operators for any alpha, they do not have the C property. <laughs> they do not have the C property. And we found that the local spectral subspace associated to the boundary of the spectrum is indeed dense in LP, independently of alpha. Okay, so it's, it has not the C property. But it has a weaker decomposability pro property. And this is basically what we will, what we will consider from here. Okay, this theorem tells you that if you have a linear bounded operator such that the point spectrum of T and the point spectrum of the adjoint is empty, that's something we need to assume if we want to understand <coughs> invariant subspaces because if the point spectrum is not empty, we're done, right? And such that the, there exist two vectors, X in X and Y in the dual, such that the nodes are dominated and the union of the local spectral at X and Y is not a singleton, then for every open set U, which it, it, it intersect this local spectral and these conditions is satisfied, we do have that the local spectral subspace of U is not dense and not zero. In other words, that means that under this condition, we have a lot of invariant subspaces. And for this, I'm not going to go into detail, but what we need is a weaker functional calculus for commutative banal algebras. And the idea is considering a weaker, the coarser topology than the Gelfand topology. It's called the whole kernel topology. And okay, I will, I will skip that part, right? But if you put all this together in the context of bishop operator, as le at least for those irrationals that we already know that they do have invariant subspaces, it tells you, that's the condition we had before, that whenever you give me an open set in the complex plane that intersect the boundary of the spectrum and is not the boundary of the spectrum, it provides you an invariant, a closed invariant subspace. That's the picture for every open set that you have here. But this is at least for all those irrational that we know they do have invariant subspaces. In other words, <coughs> As far as they have invariant subspaces, they do have uh, local spectral subspaces which are proper invariant subspaces. Actually, and I guess that's uh, the situation is under this condition is where we can apply our weaker functional calculus for every open cover of the boundary of the spectrum, this sum is always dense in LP. I mean, we can consider those are going, I mean, they, those are non-dense, each of those, okay? But the sum is dense in LP. Actually, this is the picture, right? Uh, we have that they are, this is a weaker decomposability for those bishop operators. Those, the bishop operator are not decomposable. Indeed, they do not satisfy the beta property or the delta property, okay? All right, so the question is, maybe if you take any irrational not covered by our theorem and consider just a minor this, the this of center e to minus one, right, and radius epsilon, and the local spectral 
uh, space associated to that. The question is, if are these, are these subspaces non-trivial and non-dense? Because if the answer is yes, we are done, actually. And of course, the, the wall we're trying to jump, in some sense, is avoiding this functional calculus that we were, in some sense, obligated to, to use. That would answer the question that we were trying to consider in its full generality. I think I have some references here. The basic paper by Atzmon is this one, and there are one in our chief, another one submit, and two other ones submitted. Um, I guess that's all. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So, uh, weekly decomposable operators had been introduced by Jubic Matsaev uh, without knowing that the operators they actually considered were decomposable. In, uh, so, it was for a while, it was uh, not known whether weakly decomposable are automatically decomposable, but there are counterexamples. Mm -hmm. Okay, and these are weakly decomposable in the sense that uh, you can consider this uh, decomposition. The, the closure of the uh, spectral maximum sp uh, spaces is uh, so everything. Exactly. Yeah. But yes, here yeah. we were using in so, a different in a different way. I mean, yeah. weakly decomposable mm. because we could use this funny picture I made for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question is uh, for uh, the existence of invariant subspaces, it's sufficient to have Bishop's property, for example, locally. Bishop's property is a local property. Mm -hmm. If you have it locally uh, on a set which is uh, dominating, in the, well, for which the spectrum is dominating in this uh, set, uh, then you find in a close invari hyper invariant uh, subspaces. This is uh, put uh, uh, Eschmeyer and uh, Bebe Punavo. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe one could localize the things. Okay, we didn't look at the localized uh, beta the, property. The property the bishop, we, we proved that this operator do not satisfy the beta property in any of the yes, LP. Yes. I, did, I did mention, but I didn't write it in the slides. Uh, of course, they don't satisfy also the delta they property because it's the. Uh -huh. is, yeah. the, is the dual property, and we proved it's, uh, I mean, it's possible to compute yes, the adjoint, yes. it's not very complicated, and we proved they don't satisfy the delta property also. They're not decomposable, and so, so in that sense, the, but this is, the key point is that this is true for every irrational alpha. Mm -hmm. So what I think it's more surprising, at least from my perspective, is that all these properties are satisfied independently of alpha even uh, the spectrum is independently of alpha. Yeah. And then the approach to produce invariant subspaces it really depends on the nature of alpha. So somehow we're losing yeah. the techniques there. But yeah. Any other questions? Are there some irrational numbers alpha for which we know that the T alpha is a non-trivial hyperinvariant subspace for the reasons totally different than the reasons you described. Mm. <laughs> I mean, there, somewhere uh, the that, that Werner be, theorem, the, there is yeah. <laughs> some local algebra generated by t and t minus one, which is not an integral domain. Yeah, that, that, that is a very good question indeed. I, I mean, what we were trying to, to understand was the problem uh, not depending on alpha, once we, we face the, because I think somehow the joint work with uh, uh, Ubis and with Chamizo, I mean, PhD student, better than enlarge, enlarging the set, and this is just criticizing my own work, but that's, uh, <laughs> it's, it was a negative result. I mean, it, it, there is no way to trespass applying those techniques. So it would be interesting to understand from another perspective how to produce hyperinvariant subspaces for those alpha that we know already. 
they do have, but we don't know how to produce them. Okay, if you go through the paper, Atkon is a very clever person, <laughs> very clever <laughs> mathematician. Yeah. If you go through his paper, you try to understand how these invariant subspaces are constructed, and they are based on the functional calculus. That's the problem. So that's how it is coming, because it's, uh, it's how they, they come there. But I, I don't have any other idea. But maybe you are the right person to ask. <laughs> no, but I don't have either. I, I saw this uh, similar phenomenon, and we talk about it tomorrow, but for weighted uh, Hilbert spaces of sequences, where there are two very different uh, sources of hyperinvariant subspaces. But uh, for bishop operators, I don't know. I will send you a message immediately if I get any idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, questions? Let's thank Steve again. Thank you.